Welcome to Numerical Methods. And today I like to start a new chapter, a new session on random number generation. So we saw in our application, the Monte Carlo method, that we could derive a very nice integration rule you know, by considering in the theory, a sequence of IID random variables for the Monte Carlo integration, we considered integrating on the interval from zero to one. So it was a sequence of uniform distributed IID random variables in the theoretical setup. And then to actually calculate a figure, yeah, we used a single event on that sequence that is a random number sequence. Yeah? So drawings of a uniform distributed random variable. So we need to discuss how we generate such drawings in the computer. When I motivated the section, yeah, so you maybe recall that we had this nice little plot here that is actually plotting two such sequences, yeah, or we use two such sequences to approximate the probability then I already made use of some functionality. This is here. That allows me to generate such a sequence. Yeah? So there is here this random number generator. And I can ask him, okay, please give me the next integer. And we have some kind of random sequence. So this here, 5, 3, 4, 2, 5 is our random sequence. A random sequence from the set one to six. So we already made use of this and I would like to discuss yeah, how, how this is done. And the funny thing is that in the second part, uh, the second session, uh, we will link back to the Monte Carlo method and actually we can remove this defect that it makes a statement only in probability. So this uh, section yeah, may be look a little bit yeah, as detail, how do you generate such a sequence? Yeah, but uh, the results that we discuss are very important yeah, and will give us a lot of insight on the Monte Carlo method later. Let's start by discussing the so-called pseudo-random number generation, pseudo-random number generators. So this word pseudo-random number, yeah, this is used when the sequence that we generate could in theory be predicted. Yeah? So of course we have an algorithm in the computer. Yeah? So I'm not using some uh, system that has uh, randomness built in, yeah, like the radioactivity uh, decay yeah, of uh, some material or whatever. I have an algorithm in the computer and the algorithm is still deterministic. So the sequence that we generate here only looks random, yeah? but it could be in theory predicted, but the prediction is very hard and the sequence is hard to distinguish from a sequence of true random numbers. So this term very hard yeah, is not precise. Uh, so you would expect that some properties are fulfilled, yeah, expectation, variance, or whatever. So you can check these properties. Yeah? But of course, this very hard yeah, is not a precise uh, straight statement. A nice example for such a pseudo random number generator are the linear concurrential generators. So this is a classical random number generator and here is the definition. So a linear concurrential generator generates the sequence. So my sequence is here the sequence xi, yeah? i from one, two, three, four, generates this pseudo random sequence by taking the previous element xi minus one. So that also means that I have to specify an initial value 
So the initial value is a parameter of my random number sequence. So by taking the previous uh, element and then it multiplies this previous element with a constant A and adds another constant C. And then it takes the modulus with respect to some M. Yeah? So the numbers that we generated here are in between zero yeah, and M minus one. Yeah? So actually we just take the, from the number that we generate here in this uh, bracket, we just take the remainder of the division by M. Yeah? So the remainder is either zero, one, two, or whatever up to M minus one. So this generator generates a sequence that has numbers between zero and M minus one. And if you like to depict a little bit what's going on here, we operate on integers. So maybe you recall a little bit our session on integer arithmetic. So in, in this session, yeah, we also saw that uh, adding integer numbers uh, is a little bit like uh, having calculation in equivalent classes that are modulus some number. No? So if you draw in the same way, the numbers that we generate here, yeah, so between zero and m minus one, then you can think of the calculation that we do. We start with some values, say this here is xi minus one, and then I multiply this value with some a. And maybe a is very large, yeah? So multiplying with a, would give me a number that is much larger than a multiple of M. Yeah? So which means that I go here around and around and around, and maybe I arrive at this number here. Okay, then I add the C. So adding the C will maybe move it even a little bit further. And then I take the modulus M, so I map back to this circle and I get this number here, my xi. So this going around and around and around is a little bit like a wheel of fortune, yeah? So you turn this wheel and you go around and around and around. And uh, of course, um, if your initial value is zero, yeah, then uh, multiplying with a does not have an effect. So you need to add this c, yeah, to actually get out of the zero and then you, you turn the wheel again. So this is a little bit like a wheel of uh, fortune. And this is what's what's going on here. Many built-in random number generators are linear concurrential random number generators. Also, the one that we used in our little experiment, the Java Util Random, is a linear concurrential generator. And it has a fairly huge M. The M is a 2 to the power of uh, 48. So if you like, you can go back here to our little motivational experiment. Click here on the Java Util Random Generator. You can maybe open the declaration and take a look at the code. And you see that this here is the A, the multiplier, a fairly large number. This here is the C, what is added. And this mask is actually the M minus one. Yeah? So it's masking away the other bits. Yeah? So you see this is a two to the power of 48. Yeah? The M is a two to the power of 48. For Monte Carlo simulation in high dimensions, you have to be a little bit careful when using such a linear conventional generator because they have some undesired properties. And one example is here. If you take this generator and sample, say, a random vector in higher dimensions. And yeah, how do you do this? Recall that if we have a one-dimensional sequence, we had this nice little algorithm. Yeah, we have a one-dimensional sequence of IID random variables, and we would like to have a vector sequence with IID components. Yeah, we just populate the components. So you use this rule here that we have to populate the components of this vector. And then 
this uh, linear concurrential uh, generator has the properties that if you look at these points in higher dimension, then they lie on at most m to the power of one divided by d, d the dimension hyperplanes. Yeah, so they they have some some structure. You know, they lie on a on a hyperplane. They have some structure in this uh, higher dimensional space. So there is uh, there are some gaps that are not filled. Yeah, and this problem is becoming more severe if the dimension increases. Of course, m is a large number, yeah? but dimension could be in Monte Carlo application could be very high. Yeah? Hundred dimensional space yeah, is not uh, uncommon. Let's talk about a few uh, properties. This generator has a period length. Well, the period length is when the sequence repeats. Yeah? So I have here my sequence of xi. Yeah? So this is my random number sequence. And I have a period p if x of i plus p equals xi. So um, when the series, uh, series repeats. From the definition of my generator, you see that the next value only depends on the previous value. So this means when an element occurs again, this is the point when the series repeats. So the period length of my linear concurrential generator is at most m. So why is this? Yeah, the generator generates only numbers between 0 and m minus 1. So he generates only m different numbers. So after m numbers, you can be sure that a number will reappear that has appeared before. And since the sequence only depends on the previous element, that means that this is a point where the sequence starts repeating. So this is also the reason why we are choosing here a very large M, because then we can have hope that we have a large uh, period length. Of course, the period length can be much shorter, yeah? So that depends a little bit also here on the choice of A and C. So another generator, which I would just like to mention, you know, uh, but which I will use very often in my coding experiments is Mesen Twister. You know? Maybe recall when I did the experiment on Monte Carlo integration. So, that was here, yeah, we had a Monte Carlo integrator. Then the generator that we used was Mersenne Twister. So I didn't explain what Mersenne Twister is there, but it is a random number generator which has better properties than the linear concurrential generator. For example, it has a period length of two to the power of 90,937 minus one. So that is a huge period length. This generator also is very good for applications where you have high dimensions. For example, in the paper that is referenced here, it is a little bit investigated how the properties are if you generate using our algorithm vectors out of this one-dimensional sequence. And this is equidistributed you know, in a certain sense. So with respect to the properties which we would like in high dimensions, in dimensions up to 623. Yeah, 623 dimensions sounds like a big number, but later when you discuss discretization of stochastic differential equations, you will see that a time step in a stochastic differential equation actually represents a dimension in the Monte Carlo integral. So if you have, for example, six assets, stocks, yeah, and they are discretized, the stochastic differential equation is discretized in 100 time steps, 
theoretically, you already have 600 uh, dimensions. Yeah? So six stocks with independent Brownian increments uh, would have six independent Brownian increments. 100 time steps is 600 Brownian increments that drive this stochastic process. So this Mersenne twister is not a linear concurrential generator, but it is uh, similar. Yeah? It operates on a large word, yeah? so a large state, yeah? like our linear concurrential generator operated on the previous value. And it scrambles this state and generates the new state. And this word is actually a word of 624 integers, yeah? so it has 624 times 32 bits, yeah? so this is 19,968 bits yeah? that are used as the state, um, as the previous value of this random number generator. You can look this up a little bit. Here our Mersenne twister that we used in this experiment is actually just a wrapper to the Mersenne twister implementation in the Apache Common Math Library. And you can peek into this, yeah? And you see that this generator allocates here an array, MT, yeah, of 624 integers. So this is then the value where he is operating on. Yeah. And he performs quite ugly operations on this very long, very long integer value, yeah. 90,968 bit integer value. So there is an important property of the random number generator that is called the seed. Well, if you go back to our linear concurrential generator, then you see that the way we construct it, the next value is a function of the previous value, means that actually we get always the same sequence if we have the same parameters, means if we have the same initial value. So this initial value somehow defines the sequence. We will get a different sequence if we have a different initial value. It is also the case for the Mersenne twister. He is operating here on this array MT. Yeah? So he's generating the array at the next time step. And of course, then its sequence depends on how the M T is initialized. Yeah? So this initialization is done here in this set seed, yeah? the seeding of the random number generator. So the seed of the random number generator is the a value, usually an integer, that uniquely determines the sequence. And this allows us to reproduce the sequence. So we have the same random sequence if we start with the same seed. Well, we wanted randomness, yeah? so why do we want this property? Yeah, this property is important. Yeah? Uh, for example, if you like to test your code, you would like to have that you get always the same result when you run the code again and again. Yeah? Having a different seed yeah, is maybe really disturbing because you get different result whenever you run the code again. So this property to reproduce the exact sequence is an important one. And actually I do a lot of my calculations always with the same seed. If I would like to investigate how does the result depend on the choice of the random sequence, then I can maybe modify the, the seed. So the same seed will generate the same sequence yeah, using fixed seed values allows us to reproduce our results in numerical experiments. This is an important feature. Different seeds should generate different sequences. So you think a little bit that the seed is maybe now a good thing to 
check your Monte Carlo error. Yeah? You, know, you, you should have in probability, yeah, you should have a certain error estimate. If you take different sequences, yeah, you, you see the variance related to what sequence you take. Yeah? Recall that a sequence is a single event yeah, of my sequence of IID random variables. Yeah? So a sequence is a single event. So if I now vary these events, yeah, I can check the stochastic properties. Um, note, however, that it is not guaranteed here that different seeds are a good representation of a different such drawings. Yeah. You see this also from the definition of my linear concurrential generator. Assume you have a seed x0, yeah, and then you have another seed, but this other seed is just the x1 of the previous se sequence. Then you get maybe exactly the same sequence just with a with a small shift yeah so the sequence are shifted by one element because the seed of the second sequence is the second element of the first sequence yeah and then they just reproduce the same elements but just with a small index shift so you have more or less the same sequence yeah if you use it in a monte carlo integration this means you just have a single point that is different the first point does not occur in sequence two. The last point does not occur in sequence one. However, that said, very often this works very well. Yeah, modifying the seed works very well. So maybe let's have a small experiment and look at what the seed does. Yeah, okay, this is a very trivial experiment here. I have here in random numbers experiments a class that is called random number sequence with seed experiment so what do we do i generate here a java util random generator with a given seed maybe that seed and i generate the first 30 floating point numbers so let's run this program Okay, and you see this is the sequence that I generate. So now let's run the program again. And you see I always get the same sequence. Run it again, I get the same sequence. So maybe I change the seed now. So now I get a different sequence. Yeah, So this is a 586. If I run it again, I get again the 586. So we always get the same sequence if we specify if we specify the same seed. You could also now go back to our motivation of the Monte Carlo method. You maybe recall that we had this plot here. Let's make the sequence here a little bit longer. So maybe I take 1,000 points now. And already here, you saw that I generated two different sequences, and the two different sequences are generated by having two different seeds. If you like, you can generate a third one. Okay, let's have a third one. So this is number three here. Let's also plot the third one. So I need to add it here to my plotting function. And now run this again. Okay, and you see you get another sequence, which is now the black one. Yeah. Different seed, yeah. different, different sequence. Okay, so code session, if you like to play a little bit with the seed, you can do this here in this random number sequence with seed experiment. Also, if you look at our Monte Carlo integration, we had a Monte Carlo integrator that used as a parameter here the seed. And we had this little Monte Carlo integration experiment here that was comparing the Simpsons integration with the Monte Carlo integration. Let me comment this out here. And the Monte Carlo integration used a specific seed. Let's run this Monte Carlo integration experiment again. 
So you see, we use 10 to the power of four evaluation points. So the Monte Carlo conversions rate, the theoretical is one divided by square root of 10 to the power of four. So 10 to the minus two. The Simpsons rule has one divided by n to the power of four. Yeah. Error estimate, so I would expect a 10 to the minus 16. And we get these results in accordance with the theoretical error estimates. Yeah? So this here is my result for the Monte Carlo integration, a 9389. This here is the result for the Simpsons integration, a 9589. Yeah? A 9389, just recall this, and let's change the seat, 16, 16, maybe run the experiment again. And you see now I get a different value here. Yeah? So this is still the experiment with the old seat, we also had the integration here using streams. This was with the old seed. This is with the new seed. You see the value now lies a little bit on the other side. This one was too low. This one is too high. The error is similar. Yeah. The seed is changing the sequence, so it's changing the values. This was the random number seed, yeah? Very important thing to play with. Next part is, okay, my linear concurrential generator generates a sequence of integers. If you go back to the definition, it generates a sequence of integers between zero and M minus one. And for the Java util random, the M is really large, yeah? so it generates integers between 0 and 2 to the power of 48 minus 1, yeah? including. But in my application, yeah, the Monte Carlo integration, I would like to have a sequence that is uniform, uniform on 0, 1. The things that we have discussed generate integer numbers. So I need a mapping from the integers to the floating point numbers yeah, to the set of uniforms. So if my linear concurrential generator generates all the integers in this interval from 0 to m minus 1 with, say, uniform probability, yeah. then the transformation that we do is just we divide by m. Yeah. So this z here, which is the integer number that we generate, this guy is x divided by m. So x can be 0 or m minus 1. So this is between 0 included, 1 not included. So if I have a uniform sequence on 0, m, m not included, then we use here z is x divided by m, and this is now uniform on 0, 1. Note, however, there could be a rounding error. Yeah? We take one number, divide by another number, and then we round to the nearest floating point number. And we have to be a little bit careful with, with this. But we have the following lemma that states that there is no rounding if we choose the M in a special way. The thing is that recall that our floating point numbers, so where were our floating point numbers? Deficient definition one here. These are the normalized floating point numbers, and they are defined in a certain way. There was here this C. This C is defining the discretization, say here, in this interval. Yeah. And the C was in the interval from 0 to 2 to the power of q, yeah? 0 included, 2 to the power of q not included. What we do is we choose the m as 2 to the power of q plus 1. So we generate 
integer random numbers between zero included and two to the power of Q plus one not included. The Q plus one is the precision in this definition one. If we do this, then X divided by M is a floating point number already, so no rounding is performed. So how can you see see this? So for the case x equals zero, yeah, this is a denormalized floating point number. This is, okay. So let's consider the case x larger than zero. So for x larger than zero, let k be such that x is in between two to the power of k and two to the power of k plus one. Yeah. So x, note x is an integer, next value of x is 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah. so k equals 0 yeah, if my x is equal to a 1, yeah. and so on. So then I have that x divided by m, yeah, I can express this as 2 to the power of k plus 2 minus 2 to the power of k divided by m. And then I move the factor 2 to the power of k out. So I get from this here, I get a 1. So I'd like to make transformations such that this looks like my normalized floating point number. Yeah? So I would like to represent now the x in this representation. And then, of course, I have to check the c and the E, yeah, are they in accordance with my st specification? So this is what I would like to do. So I have already now created the one plus form, but now with a divided by two to the power of K. Well, what I would like to have is the two to the power of Q in my floating point representation. Yeah, so just take this out. I divide by a 2 to the power of q, and I multiply with a 2 to the power of q, and the division by the 2 to the power of k just moves here to the top. So nothing, nothing happened. So what happens to the exponent part? Well, you have a 2 to the power of k divided by the m, but you know the m is actually a two to the power of q plus one. So you can write this part as a two to the power of k minus q plus one. Okay, so this part here is just the same as this part and this part is just the same as this part. So now we are in the form of a floating point number. So what is my C? Yeah, my C is this part. This is the C. And my E, my exponent, is this part. This is my E. And now check that. Since x was between 2 to the power of k and 2 to the power of k plus 1, my c is indeed in the range from 0 to 2 to the power of q. And since k is larger or equal 0, and here on top I made this assumption that the e min in the floating point representation is less or equal minus q plus 1. This is the case. Yeah, Recall the q for the double precision floating point number is 52. And so uh, I would have a minus 53 here. The exponent can be much smaller. Yeah? So I have that my e is actually larger than e min. Yeah? So I find the result that x is a normalized floating point number. So x divided by m already is a floating point number, so no rounding is performed. 
So the M should be chosen for the floating point doubles as 52 plus 1, which is 53. For the single precision floating point numbers, the Q was uh, 23, so the Q plus 1 is a 24. And indeed, if you now take a look, so let's have a look here at the Java Util random number generator. So you see this guy here has methods generate a floating point number, a single precision one, or generate a double precision floating point number. And if you look at the description, what is done is he's generating a number between zero and two to the power of 24, and he's dividing it by two to the power of 24. So the M is a two to the power of 24. By the way, this is just a cryptic way of writing two to the power of 24. It is one bit shifted by 24 shifts. Yeah, So this is just a two to the power of 24. The interesting thing is that they have here this comment. Yeah, In earlier versions of Java, the result was incorrectly calculated using a two to the power of 30 yeah, for the M yeah, and divide by a two to the power of 30. Yeah, they use two to the power of 30 and you think this is maybe more accurate. Yeah, This is better. Yeah, So this might seem equivalent, but it is not better. In fact, it introduced a slight non-uniformity because of the bias in the rounding of the floating point numbers. Okay, so you see in an earlier version, they had this mistake and now they used the correct value as in our little lemma. For floating point double precision numbers, the Q is a 52. So Q plus one is a 53. So my M according to this lemma should be a two to the power of 53. However, this random number generator cannot generate a random number between 0 and 2 to the power of 53. He only generates between two to 0 and 2 to the power of 48. So he generates two integers and combines them. So one is between 0 and 2 to the power of 26, and the other is between 0 and 2 to the power of 27. So the first guy is multiplied with the 2 to the power of 27 so this is between 0 and 2 to the power of 53. Yeah? And you then divide by the 2 to the power of 53. So they also use here exactly the M that co corresponds to the specific value of the floating point representation. Yeah? Very nice link between random number generation and floating point arithmetic. So this has no rounding. So we have really nice uniformity of the floating point number. So here, little remark, yeah, float and double. They use exactly these values in the implementation of the Java util random. Float uses an m of 2 to the power of 24, and double uses an m of 2 to the power of 53. Here are the links to this web page that we have discussed. Small exercise, maybe now we can use this sequence between 0, 1 and generate um, a vector yeah, in 0, 1 squared. So this links back to our algorithm that generates vectors. So there is a small experiment here called random vector plot yeah, and just maybe re read the code. What do we do? I specify that I would like to generate 1000 sample points. I use my Java util random generator with a seed of 3141. And then I loop over all my sample points and I take the first floating point double number. So this is my next double here. To populate the first entry of my vector, the x, and I take 
the second element from the sequence to populate the second entry of my vector, and then I go on. Yeah? So it is exactly this algorithm that I'm performing here. Then I store this in some arrays and some list and just create a scatter plot. So if I run this, we have now this picture. So every point is now a random vector in two dimension. I'm sampling the cube zero to one squared. Okay, so random vector in two dimension with 1000 points. Yeah, that was it for pseudo random number generation. And uh, my next chapter will be on the discrepancy. And we will actually discuss, is it a good thing that we have here in this plot regions where we have very few points and also regions where we have maybe many, many points, some kind of clustering. And actually, this is related to the fact that Monte Carlo has a convergence order of one divided by square root of n. While if you would look at the Riemann sum that does an equi distribution, has one divided by n. So distributing the points more evenly could be an advantage. So we move a little bit away from the randomness.